What a blessed opportunity to stand before all of you. And uh, greetings from Uganda. I have loved the man Dimitri. He's, he's, he's given us quite a wonderful, I mean, he's opened my mind to so much. I, I think he's left, but let's celebrate him. And all the wonderful people that I believe God has graced us deliberately to give whatever. Are we okay? To give, you know, from whatever perspective I believe God has given them. And why I love this is because it's like a cornucopia of wisdom. Like every man and woman is bringing from their world. And I imagine by the end of this conference, what everyone is going to go back with. It's going to be amazing. Come on, let's celebrate that. So yes, I have been given an opportunity to say a few things, but as well receive and I'm enjoying whatever I'm receiving. My brother Vus is here. Them be quiet. I love this man dangerously. <laughs> and it's amazing that in many of these conferences we are, you know, crossing, you know, paths. I, I feel that God is doing something with Africa, and I'm so proud to, to, to do this with you. And uh, many people that are behind this, Mr. Kayongo and your family, whole team. Come on, let's celebrate them. I really do thank God for this. I know many of you have come from five, had people flying in for the conference from different states in America and outside America, some of as far as Uganda. Come on, let's welcome them. Now, they gave me a topic to present here, and it is as long as it can be. I know those of you who are writing might want to write this, but it's called Unlocking Spiritual Patterns for Business Mastery in Building Generational Wealth. Unlocking Spiritual Patterns for Business Mastery in Building Generational Wealth. Unlocking Spiritual Patterns. I'll start this way. Whether we believe it or not, life is spiritual. Life is spiritual. You cannot explain the laws of life, the forces of life, without connecting to the spiritual, without appreciating and recognizing that actually there is a spiritual realm. Even our scientists who tend only to deduce things from the scientific world, empirical evidence, hypothetical expressions, cannot explain how certain things have come to some of the greatest scientists that we know in the world. For example, some of us have heard of Watson's structure of DNA. In that young, in that gentleman's story, when they asked Watson, how did he get this whole structure down? How did he draw the structure of the DNA? Watson said that it came to him through a dream of the night. It is not something that he applied through the science he knew. It's something that came to him through a dream of the night. And the next morning, he could literally design or draw the DNA structure. That did not come from the world that can be explained. That came from a world or a realm that many of us cannot explain. Dimitri Mendelov, Mendelev, I think, the fellow who gives us what you call the, the periodic structure. This, the periodic table, sorry. He also says that it came in a dream of a night. Albert Einstein, the man of the theory of relativity, E equal mc squared, says that 
he did quite a lot of research, studied many things, but he recognizes in his own story that certain things came to him through visions. He carried intuitions he can't explain, but he believed that these intuitions, these visions did not come from the realms of men. It came from a realm unknown. I could tell you story upon story upon story, but to the end that not everything we have or see given to us actually by the beautiful world of science can be explained from the realm known. We believe that there is a realm that is unknown. I heard the story of this young man who's just eating chicken wings. And an idea comes in his head that quite now is going to revolutionize the world of flight like we know it. I believe in that world. And that is why we have this thing in the extreme right corner here. Bible meets business how to unlock the secret to business success using the Bible. Because it's also one known fact that nobody can deny that the Bible has been one of the most accurate, consistent, and effective books in empowering people to build wealth. This is an undeniable fact. Anybody who has used the Bible, can I see a few hands here? Anybody who has read your Bible, you can affirm that there are principles, there are patterns that God has revealed that no doubt have revolutionized business and success like we know. Of course, research has proved that I think some of the biggest or richest people on the face of the earth are Jews. And it is also ascribed to the principles that they have used through, I mean, that they have borrowed from Biblical foundation. The church, as we know it, and I believe one of the richest entities on the face of the earth, has for centuries been borrowing ancient wisdoms as scriptures have taught us. And some of those things I want to take an opportunity, even to those of you who doubt, I want to take an opportunity to delve into these things in a few minutes and open your eyes because I have a foundation of being a banker. And I had the opportunity of starting with a bank that was starting from scratch and became a success. As front office, as bank office, I understand operations. I understand so much in the banking system, more than many people uh, would understand working in a bank because some of them usually identified with one area and, 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 and practiced that all through their banking life. But I, like I told you, I did my front banking. I did my back office. I understood clearing. I understood trading. I understood lending. I, you know, the systems that were set, I was among the few people that were pioneering some of these things. So they had to train us in many of these aspects. I understand banking. Of course, not more than many people, in the, a few people in this room. I can't say that I'm the best there is but at least I understand how, how banks work, how these systems work. And I had the opportunity of looking at seeing wealth from a different perspective. I saw people become wealthy at my watch. I saw people lose it all at my watch. I saw wisdoms that learned to preserve wealth. I saw people who spoke big but did not have much. I saw people who are indifferent to how the principles of, you know, who are indifferent to the principles and patterns of life as we know it. They did not respect that there's a, a right way to do things, that there's a true way to do things. Because some of us think that we have to manipulate things, cook books, find shortcuts in life for us to be a success. The Bible calls that a shame that comes with glory or a glory that comes with shame or empires that are built but have no glory with them because they have something they cannot replicate in another person because it really didn't come by principle or pattern. Then there's a manipulation of systems in the back end that can't multiply what they carry to another person. Those of you who read the Bible, this wonderful man called Paul, he says that 
when I went to preach this gospel, I made sure that I would allow this word to work in me so thoroughly that I would make the Gentiles obedient in word and deed, that whatever is working on your life is what you're able to multiply and give other people. If it's not working in your life, it doesn't matter how much you have crammed it, it doesn't matter how wonderful you can present it, if it's not coming from your spirit, it carries no multiplication effect to affect others. Of course, not all of us will have the language the articulation, everyone has their own unique gifting, but when you have the spirit of a thing, it's easy to manipulate, multiply it through to other people. And that's what I see uh, in the choices that Brian made in bringing all the preachers or speakers that are here today. I see that everyone has a grain of that distinction. I feel that we are in the presence of greatness and a lot is going to come out of here. The Bible says in Proverbs 21 verses 20, it says that there's oil in the dwelling of the wise. There's oil in the dwelling of the wise. Treasure, sorry, to be desired, and oil in the dwelling of the wise. There's a treasure to receive every time you sit in front of a wise man, a sage, somebody who's experienced in, an, in a field. You'll always receive something from them and oil to be received or taken in the dwelling of the wise. But the Bible says, but the foolish man wasteth it, wasteth it. You know, you, you can sit in this conference and waste what God has designed for you to receive. But I pray that you don't lose anything in whatever God has designed you to receive through this conference. I've realized that everything we're looking for, as some of us who read the Bible have learned, Either you're born with something or a man carries it or you learn the, the principles or patterns that take you to that thing. But there's always three doors or, or pillars that God has used to direct us or connect us to the things that we must align ourselves to and become eventually. Some of us are born a certain way with certain graces and I believe we need that. But also there are things we'll carry or receive along the way when we connect to people who have excelled or gone before us. And three, he says, there are also those things we shall connect to when we learn to align ourselves to the principles that lead us to these things, okay? It's one thing to be born gifted as a footballer, for example, and maybe connect to the right coach, but not go out in the field to train. You see that? So your application is required that mental or spiritual authority, your midwife is needed. But it's also important that you align yourself to the thing that so connects to your essence since birth. And all of us in some way or another have found ourselves or are still finding ourselves. I think one of the greatest um, experiences for any man on earth is to actually find yourself. Because I've seen people fail in life because they are in the wrong profession they're in the wrong calling, they're doing the wrong assignment. It's just not who they are. But wherever we find ourselves, if God by his grace can direct us, it's, it becomes so easy and effortless to become what you are already designed by God to be. I feel that every person speaking here carries a distinctive anointing and it's calling out something in everybody listening to me. And don't be mistaken that because we're standing before you, therefore we're greater than you in any aspect or every aspect of life. We also have parts that are incomplete, that other people in our lives are completing. And that's what I think humbles us. Because not every man, not, not all of us know everything, or any of us actually knows everything. But we pick bits and pieces from whatever everybody is able to give, and then you become a perfect being day by day. I'll give an example. Brian is doing land, okay? I'm a businessman as well. I ran at least six successful businesses. I, I learned, I've have learned a lot and the way I understand my world can or will be different from the way Brian presents his world and my voice will present differently. But when you talk about land from my world, I begin from the perspective of the spiritual. In Christianity, we believe that land is spiritual. Oh yes, real estate, 
business, you'll call it property development. Whatever name you give it, property advisory and investment, it all touches the land, isn't it? Nothing on the face of the earth in some way does not come from the earth or receive from the earth. The brick that built this building came from the earth, but it was from the earth free. Isn't it? The wood that is in the pillars or columns is from, was from a tree that received from the earth. The clothes we're putting on, the cotton is grown from the ground. Everything, the iron that is on your cars, the neodymium magnets that are making your speakers, everything you see, carries its bearing from the earth. The gold, the diamond, the silver, the topaz, everything, it doesn't matter how rare and expensive that mineral is, it all comes from the earth. And it was from the earth free. That's why the Bible says in Ecclesiastes that the earth was created for the profit of all men. For the profit of all men. Not only was it given to man free, but God has designed life that everyone on the earth should receive the profit or the substance of the earth. So when we talk about poverty from that perspective, it means that that person has not either been given the opportunity or the tools through wisdom to connect to the blessing of the earth. To connect to the blessing of the earth. Those of you who are writing notes, you can write Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 9. The profit of the earth is for all. And the king himself is also served by that field. This is very important. No man on the face of the earth should not receive the substance of the earth, the provisions and the wealth that are given to us. Yes, you can say governments are designed in a way where things are not unequally going to be distributed and stuff like that. And that is true. But I also want you to know that there's a parallel world here. You have your physical where life is not going to be fair, things will never be balanced, but you also have a spiritual which has been provided by God to allow you to access whatever is due you and even teaches you how to multiply whatever you have received so you can receive the best on the earth. I don't believe that there's a man on the earth that was created to fail. None of us was created to fail. But I believe that all of us will receive and connect as far as we are able to translate whatever has been given freely. You must begin life from the perspective of understanding that everything, no matter how much value it carries on the earth, it actually began from a state of being free. It was once free. It was once free. But there's a wisdom that gave it value, that translated it from the realm unseen spiritual and brought it to the realm which is sin, that gold they got from the ground and shaped it. It became a ring, and that ring became wealth for the man who shaped it. You see what I'm saying? This is important for us to understand this. In Genesis, for those of you who read your Bible, if you remember, there's, a, there's two brothers which go to the Lord to give a sacrifice. One was Cain, another was Abel. And the scriptures tell us that Abel gave a more worthy sacrifice. Cain takes his brother to the field and kills him because he was jealous. But God told him even before he killed his brother that don't you know if you had done well, your sacrifice would have been acceptable as well. But instead of seeking to know from God how to improve himself to be a greater version of himself or to receive the acceptation that his brother Abel had received, he instead went to kill his brother because that's just human nature. It thinks that by deeming another light, demeaning another individual, disqualifying another grace, they will replace and take the advantage. But that's not how life works. If you find a person who knows how to do something so well, humble yourself and learn from them. Just learn. That's, what, that's the lesson God was trying to give Cain. That don't you know that if you had done well, you would have been accepted or your gift would have been acceptable. And at that point, Cain should have asked God, 
what am I supposed to do? He didn't ask a question. He instead went to slay his brother. This is the fallen world and that's how we live. We live in a world where people are seeking to kill greatness. Whenever they see those who are rising and people who are advantaged and advancing in life, they feel that if I can replace you, if I can frustrate you and take you out of the picture, I will be seen. But the question is, to my brother Cain, when you kill Abel, will, will you still know how to sacrifice right? Will your sacrifice be acceptable before God? And listen to the curse. God tells Cain, because you have done this thing, the Bible says that the earth has opened its mouth to swallow your brother's blood. And from henceforth, he said, the earth shall not yield forth its substance to you. This earth, he said, shall not yield her strength to you. That's a very powerful thing. The earth will not yield her strength to you. That means this earth has strength. It has an intellect. It responds to some people differently from other people. And because of that, the Bible says you shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. A fugitive and a vagabond. You'll be a beggar and a restless person. Then Cain tells God, oh, what a heavy punishment you have given me. It means whoever finds me shall kill me. That means people just don't die. When the earth holds its strength from you, even a stray bullet can kill you. It doesn't matter how much science you have on your head. Not everybody who dies, dies a natural death. Or that it was accorded in life for them to die that way. But when the land rejects you, it doesn't matter how much you have on your head, you can never be a success. There are people who have it up. You don't have everything you would need to be a success, but they're not successful. You understand what I'm saying? That is why some people can't explain this immigrant, immigrant paradox. How a man from a foreign nation comes in that nation and builds wealth in the very nation. And in that very nation, you see people begging on the streets. They are failing in a land where all dreams ought to be interpreted. And a man comes from the poorest background and comes in that land and becomes one of the most successful lawyers. And another child was born in the same street or perhaps even had way, obviously had way more greater opportunities in life than this young man who was from Greece is now on the street somewhere taking drugs. He's a beggar and a fugitive on the earth. The earth cannot yield forth its substance or fruit to this person. Ladies and gentlemen, whether you agree with this or not, there are people who seem to be advantaged on this earth. Things seem to be agreeable and aligned for them in such a supernatural way that you can't explain this scientifically. It's not luck. It's not coincidence. It's not accident. Certain laws are working for them. The forces of life are attracting everything that they need and it's aligned to their assignment on the earth. This is why I want to introduce you to the seriousness of this thing called purpose. Because you have a generation that thinks that, oh, let me go and learn how to make a lot of money to what end that my wife will live well and my children. That's a very myopic understanding of life. You get it? There's somebody who just thinks so short-sighted. If my family is okay and my wife is okay and I can live on a very wonderful beach, you know, buy myself a yacht, you know, uh, build myself the biggest house on the face of the earth, then I'm, yeah, that's success. Then you find men like Elon Musk. They live in a very little small house like this, little room. They're no longer interested in how many rooms they can sleep in because they're living for a purpose bigger than themselves. Elon Musk in his head is not working for his two, three children. No, that's not where his brain is. He's doing something that is actually going to change humanity. Like we know it. This is about dreaming way bigger than many of us can see. And some of us just beyond that selfish spirit to just acquire wealth without direction and purpose. I pray for you that your mindset will change, that whatever you're receiving tonight will take you out of this room with purpose. Say amen. <laughs> what was that? The computer agreed. <laughs> now let's go into the deeper stuff. When I studied this Bible, 
And I studied how wealth is built, how things work. I think for me, the most revolutionizing experience of my life was how quick I made my first million dollar. Because there are, like I said, principles the world explains and they're applicable, but they're also principles that are built from a fallen system, Babylonian. I know I might not make sense to some of you. Sometimes I get two people here, I get a British person and I get a Ugandan person. And somebody says, oh, I live in Britain and I live, or in America and I live in one of the greatest lands, richest countries in the world. And you ask them, okay, what did you buy with cash? The person tells you, no, nothing. Okay, I bought my house on credit, my car on credit, my shoes on credit. The other day, somebody, a couple of years ago, somebody took me to the theater and they were paying with credit, you know. And <laughs> it's not wrong to have credit, by the way. But it's a problem if you can't afford it. Do you understand what I'm saying? You are comparing yourself with a Ugandan who built that house with their own money because they could afford it and they made it hard earned. They bought that car with their own money. They could afford it and it was hard earned. That shoe, those properties that they have, who is richer? How many of you don't know in the Bible, very clearly, or how many of you know biblically, that whoever borrows is a servant to the lender. You are a servant to whoever lends you money. Again, I'm saying it's not wrong to borrow if you can pay. If you have the wisdom and ability to pay. But how many people borrow because the system requires you to borrow and you're going to stay enslaved for the rest of your life to that system? You'll never come out. It will sink you. Am I making sense? Of course, there are richer people who are smart enough to use credit to build with wealth. Kudos to them. They're wise. But they can afford it. Are you following what I'm saying? But if you can't afford what you're borrowing, then you're a slave, whether you believe it or not. Whether you believe it or not. So I start to study this Bible and I see, I study Joseph and I see revelation. I see principles and patterns. I study Jesus Christ. I might touch something there towards the end. And I see revelation. I study David. I see how he, uh, principles of wealth. I study Isaiah. I study Ezekiel. I study all these wonderful people. I'll give an example. Today I want to touch a man called Solomon. Solomon. Because many people understand Solomon. And yet Solomon is not even, Solomonic wisdom is not the highest realm of wealth. In this dispensation, we have something called messianic wisdom. The wisdom on the Messiah was higher than the wisdom on Solomon. He says that the queen of the south and all the wise people gathered to come and receive the wisdom of Solomon. But one with greater wisdom is come. That means I can do even greater through the person of Christ, messianic wisdom, than what I could do through Solomon. Yet, Solomon was a very wealthy man. Read your Bible, and I'll read for you a small story here. Remember, and I want us to, let me first take us back so I read this small sh short story for us to appreciate what I'm saying. Remember, David has died and he has left his son instead called Solomon to take over. And the scriptures tell us, God appears to Solomon in the vision of the night. Should have been First Kings chapter 3, somewhere there. And in that vision, he asks Solomon, what can I give you? Solomon did not ask for wealth. Read your Bible. Solomon did not ask for wealth. He asked God for a wise and an understanding heart that he might be able to judge purpose, the people of God. 